So in the game, what classes are available and what advantages and disadvantages uh, are uh, ascribed to each? So what we wanted to do, you know, we've always had combat roles in our games. We started out as an amateur mod team ten years ago working on a, a mod called Quake 3 Fortress which came, became quite popular. We had ten character classes in that. Then we did uh, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, which was five, and we settled on five character classes being about the right number, uh, even through Enemy Territory Quake Wars as well, which we made for the PC, although we didn't yeah. do the console versions. But in, uh, in those games you had um, not just infantry, but you had fire support in the form of artillery or airstrikes, and that used to be called the field ops. Well, clearly we don't have any uh, fighter jets or anything like that in Brink, because there, aren't the, there isn't the fuel you know, really even to run the helicopters particularly well anymore. So one of the things that um, that we realized is that what you want is a combat role to really be kind of focused and represent the playing style that somebody prefers themselves. And these are generally you know, people either play as a kind of all-out assault, and that's what they have fun doing, or they like to be kind of stealthy and sneaky and play more on their own, or they like to play a supporting role, uh, you know, repairing, constructing things, putting down turrets, that kind of stuff, or they like to play something like the medic, which is quite heroic, um, and still a kind of combat uh, role, like a combat medic. So those are the four roles that we have. You can play soldier, who's the assault guy, engineer, which is the support character class, uh, you can play operative, which is the stealthy combat role, and then of course you can play medic. Mm -hmm. And how do you encourage cooperation and teamwork between all these various classes? It's quite funny, you know, we, as gamers, all of us are selfishly motivated to do <laughs> the things that lead to us having the most fun. So we have a character advancement system in Brink, and the character advancement system rewards you as you level up with cool outfits that let everybody else know how cool you are, and abilities and items and tools and gadgets to make the game more fun to play. The way you level up is by earning experience points, just as you would do in any other standard RPG. But where Brink differs is that we essentially give you the most XP when you do things that lead to the game being more fun for other people. So if you're giving out ammunition, you're giving out health, you're a medic and you're defending the most valuable player who's trying to blow up a gate, you're escorting the NPCs, you're repairing things, constructing things, all of those actions that lead to the game being more fun for your teammates give you more experience points. So we bribe you to make the more game more fun for other people. Awesome. Uh so let's talk for a second about Brink's visual style. It's really distinct. Uh, it's kind of halfway between realism and hand-drawn uh, mm -hmm. cartoon. Who envisioned the style, uh, and did you find it challenging to execute uh, in the programming environment? Well, it, it all started with us hiring a guy called Olivier Leonardi. Uh, Olivier was the art director behind Prince of Persia and Rainbow Six Vegas. And um, he has a, a few great leads in his team. Um, Fabrice, who did Splinter Cell, is our lead animator. And uh, Tim Appleby, our lead character artist, who's responsible for Shepard and the main aliens in, uh, in Mass Effect. Um, those guys, plus our concept art team, we have two brilliant concept artists, I should mention their names because <laughs> I don't mention them enough, Laurel and Georgi, who are just phenomenal at the stuff that they do. But it all came with kind of, it starts with Olivier's vision. And Olivier really wanted you know, exaggerated characters to avoid what people call the uncanny valley, which is this notion that if you try to make characters look too realistic, they start to look dead and not real and not really exist. Um, he wanted you to be able to quickly tell what was in front of the gun because it's a fast-paced action game, so that's important. And he wanted the two factions to have a distinct palette so that it was really clear that these are the security guys, they're silvery, bluey, you know, that kind of thing. And the really colourful guys who wear, you know, all of their gear is basically stolen and begged and borrowed um, it, it is clearly the resistance uh, members. So he started working with our, our concept artists on a kind of hyper-realism, exaggerated proportions uh, style for the characters. And to be honest, I was fairly scared of it at first. It wasn't <laughs> something that sat well with me because I'd just been making realistic shooters for such a long period of time. So it, is, it was difficult, you know, to, to kind of get my head around at the beginning. But I admitted, actually, in a developer diary just at the end of, uh, I think, the middle of last year, that Olivier was right all along. Because once I started to see it really come together, you know, it's just clear that, you know, when you look at Brink, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at a screenshot or you're looking at the front end of the game or you're looking at some movie footage online or what have you, it's just really obviously Brink all the time. It's a very distinct and unique look for a game. And, and in some ways, it's kind of developed into a house style for splash damage. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about the audio uh, the audio design you guys uh, did. You were telling me earlier about the various types of uh, 
sounds that emanate from the gun when mm -hmm. uh, it's at your uh, you're aiming down the iron sights versus right. when it's at your hip. Um, also, our, our audio director is called Chris Sweetman. He actually came into the industry out of uh, out of movies originally, so he worked on movies like Goldeneye and stuff when he was much younger, and uh, then he went on to do Black and Burnout Paradise, which are both very well known for having great audio. Um, as our um, kind of audio director and the guy who's in charge of everything to do with sound, so not just uh, sound effects but sound design uh, and music, of course, as well. What he wanted was just to give the game a real, uh, a real kind of visceral feel. I think at Splash Damage we all know that 30% of what you see is actually what you hear. Um, for weapons, he started off by going out to Nevada, so he flew over from London and rented a quarry and um, about 100 semi-automatic weapons, and then set up 21 microphones throughout this quarry so he could record ejecting brass, bullet flybys, bullet impacts on different surface types and so on from a vast array of weapons that we would then use as a reference library for how he would then go on to design and create completely unique and original sounds. But he's been, I mean, if you talk to Chris about it, he's so passionate. He's spent about 10 years just trying to perfect the shotgun sound. And one that we have at Brink actually has a lion roar embedded in it because he realized that predatorial um, anim animalistic noises cause a certain amount of tension in humans because, you know, basically we were prey for a long period of time and, uh, and that works really effectively. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on with the audio, but the result is that it just feels really visceral, you know? Um, everything has a distinct feel as well. So the resistance, you know, their equipment is so badly maintained and they don't have the resources to do a good job of it. Their guns are all kind of hand-painted with slogans and stuff. They, uh, they sound very different when you fire them uh, from the securities, which are much more sort of well-oiled and greased and looked after. But also when you fire, you know, straight down the barrel, the gun sounds different to how you're firing it from your shoulder so there's a constant feel that the audio is supporting the stuff that you're doing when you change your outfits the audio changes slightly you hear as you move around as well very cool uh tell me what's the coolest thing you've ever seen in a brink play session <laughs> Difficult well, question, I, I, I mean, know. One of the, I mean, the thing, the thing about Brink is that it's because of its emergent gameplay, this notion that you start the game, you know, perhaps just being really into the story and the idea of it as, as a single player game with, you know, this big overarching storyline and everything else. But soon enough, you're going to find yourself playing cooperatively online because it's just so much fun. And then those stories become your own player stories, the, the experiences that you've had and that you've done. So I'll tell you a story about the last game we did before Enemy Territory Quake Wars, and it'll give you a sense of why I'm so obsessed with this. Sure. But I'm going to say my favorite story for, for the day that Brink, you know, ships and probably write it up for the Splash Damage website. Um, and it ships on May 17th, by the way. Back in Enemy Territory Quake Wars, when I had played all of our past games, like Quake Through Fortress, I played, you know, Engineer in the ramp room on two forts for basically two years. And all I did in my clan matches was stand pretty much in the same location with my sentry in a certain spot, my dispenser in a certain spot, and do nothing other than that constantly, right? <laughs> So we wanted it to feel like when you play you have stories you can tell other people because when we won the first UK Team Fortress tournament back in 2000, I was so proud and when I tried to explain to my mum what it was that we'd been doing, she just <laughs> didn't get it at all. It's like trying to tell someone about paintball or something. So with, with Enemy Territory Quake Wars, the first time my mum came to me and asked me you know, what the game was like and what it was about, I was able to say to her, okay, I, I took on the role of a spy, I grabbed a quad bike and I drove up behind a mountain, I base jumped off the top of the mountain, hit my parachute, <laughs> landed in the enemy base, stuck into their spawn room, stuck a third eye camera up on the wall so I could see what was going on, and then ran around and disabled all of their objectives before stabbing guys in the back as they came out. I mean, that's the sort of experience that you're able to retell. Richard Hamm has a brilliant one from Brink where he was playing as a spy. He disguised himself as the enemy and he got into this base and uh, was in the location with everybody else from the enemy team who are defending this final objective and none of them have noticed that Richard Hamm is disguised or is one of those guys. Now the job in this map, and this map is, is no longer in production, but the idea behind it was that you had this little sub and, and the team had to come in and they had to start the engines to get away with something that they'd stolen. So he was standing inside that location and waiting and just thinking about what to do. And it was the first time he'd used, a, 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 you know, the, the operative disguise ability uh, really effectively. He'd snuck in, he was really nervous and he was shaking and he just thought, if anybody spots me, I'm dead immediately. But if I get away with this, you know, I could win the entire game. Well, his team comes rushing in and they're all firing and he doesn't know if the team's going to make it. And he's wondering about whether he should fire back or what he should do. And just as he does that, the guy who's bringing in the bit of data that has to be stopped 
Poland dies and drops it just outside <laughs> the entrance, leaving one guy remaining on the enemy team who's capable of returning that bit of data. And while all of this is happening, the countdown timer is like five, four, three. So he's convinced that he's completely screwed. And then he realizes he's going to lose his disguise if he shoots. So he moves quickly behind the other guy, shoots him in the back of the head, grabs the data, hits the start button on the sub, and wins the match with a second to go. And that stuff just doesn't happen when you capture flags and stuff, right? <laughs> Brilliant. So anyway, that's Brink. It's coming out on the uh, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC on uh, May 17th, which is also my dad's birthday, which is cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, man. Thank you very much.